Picture it, a beautiful beach at sunset. A fox is frolicking happily along the beach, kind of getting his paws wet in the waves, when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes a hunter. Hounds are circling, hunters trying to get the fox, but he doesn't get the fox because there's another hunter, a second guy who swoops in and kills the fox. So you have the dead fox carcass kind of bleeding in the sand, and the two guys are about to punch each other's lights out over this poor, dead fox. And as they're about to punch each other's lights out, they stop, and there's this moment of recognition as they realize <gasps> they're long-lost twins. They were separated at birth, and they're reunited over this fox. So they embrace, and they decide to open a taxidermy shop. And they call it, what does the fox say? Nothing anymore. <laughs> and they incorporate in Delaware, and they're good to go. So the first part of that story, I'm sure, sounded familiar to all of you, because it's the factual predicate from that canonical property law case, Pearson versus Post, that all law students pretty much read in their first year. The second part probably didn't sound familiar at all, because I made it up. You all know that. But if you were one else, especially if you hadn't done the reading, <laughs> you might not have any idea that what I said just came out of nowhere. And as law professors, when we're in front of our classrooms, we are storytellers. We are storytellers with authoritative and unique access to the stories we tell. And because we're storytellers, we can learn a lot from other storytellers. And I want to focus today on one other group of professional storytellers, improvisational comedians. And those are the folks who go on stage with no script and try to make the audience laugh. Now, on the surface, we may not seem to have a lot in common with comedians. Comedians are crazy, and they know it. We don't think we're crazy. And improv, the essence of improv, has been said to be taking things to illogical conclusions. As law professors, we are tasked with taking things to logical conclusions. But we all tell stories, theirs are fake, ours are real. Nonetheless, like improvisers, we have to make a series of split-second decisions about how best to tell our stories. And we ultimately have to do it without a script, because no matter how well we prepare, something will not go according to plan. And not only do we need to be comfortable with that, we need to embrace it, because very often that is where the learning with and from our students happens. So three essential concepts from improv that can translate into our classrooms as improv interventions. And they are suggestions, status, and stakes. Suggestions. Improvisers have suggestions instead of scripts. Typically, in any form of improv, your scene is going to start with a suggestion from an audience. So a suggestion might be, give me a non-geographic location. And the audience says, taxidermy shop. And so one improviser goes on stage, another guy follows him on, and the first guy says, I'm going to stuff this fox with cotton. And the second guy says, that's really good, make it free trade organic. And then they sort of go from there. So what has just happened is the second guy has accepted the first guy's offer. And he's done it with a yes and. He's agreed with the underlying premise, and he's built off of it. And yes and is the improv constitution. If there is one cardinal rule in improv, it's accept every offer with a yes and. Because what happens if you don't? OK, so two guys are in a taxidermy shop. First one says, I'm stuffing this fox with cotton. And the second guy says, no, you're not. You're a turkey. And I'm going to stuff you, because this is Thanksgiving. And then all of a sudden, right? OK, well, the scene has just died, because the second guy's blocked the first guy's offer. It's going nowhere. So as law professors, we actually are very, I think, uncomfortable with yes and. We're more no-because types. 
And it's not clear to me if we're this way by temperament or training or both, but we really do know because like it's our job, which I think it's not, but we do it like it's our job. We see it as intellectually rigorous. We see it as efficient. Our students see it as crap, particularly early on because they're terrified of it. So they stop talking. They stop making suggestions to us. So the improv intervention here is to try to use suggestions in a meaningful way. When students come into the class, the default is that they're audience members. And we can keep them there from time to time and take suggestions from them as if they were audience suggestions and pivot off of them and do whatever we want. But the more meaningful way to use suggestions is to bring our students on stage as scene partners. And we can do this by making compelling and strong offers ourselves in terms of our questions, in terms of our visuals, in terms of our performance. And then when they respond, we yes and what they have to say. And that doesn't mean we accept every single detail because again, we're taking things to logical conclusions. But it means we are actively listening and trying to understand what they're saying and that's the essence of yes and. Second improv intervention is status. Now you are probably all thinking I'm crazier than a fox for talking to a room of law professors about status because you're thinking, we've got this, right? We think about status all the time. We decide whether our students call us by first name or call us professor. We notice who's a lecturer and who's a full professor. Well, that's actually not status the way improvisers see it. That's title and rank. Improvisers see status as energy, as bearing, as demeanor, the way you walk into a room and the way you work a room. So you can have a high status fox who turns on its pursuers and chases them off the beach. And in comedy, that's funny, that disconnect between title and rank and status. And what we want to do in our classrooms is to decouple, I think, this idea of title and rank as ultimately being equated with status. So what do I mean by that? Well, you can have the endowed chair of Blackacre, Blackstone, Pufendorf, John Grisham, professor of truth and righteousness, right? Who's a very low status speaker. And you can have the peon professor of paper clips and post-it notes who really is high status. And so we want to challenge ourselves, no matter what our rank, to be high status when we're in front of a classroom. We also want to challenge ourselves to make sure we empower our students, all our students, to be high status and sometimes to learn how to be low status when they need to be listening to us or to each other. And that places a big responsibility on us to actively listen, not just with our ears, but with our eyes and all of our other spidey senses to the room and figure out who is Ms. Question Pants, who always is going to have her hand up, and who is Mr. Backbench Guy, who is not paying any attention to us. And we have to try to take them out of those status roles. Otherwise, we, dare I say, perpetuate the status quo. And as we're all talking about today, there are ways in which we don't want to do that. Last but not least, stakes. Something has to matter in law teaching right? And something has to matter in an improv scene. If you have two guys on a beach with a fox and the two guys sit down and start doing document review, <laughs> well then, I'm sorry, unless the fox is the opposing party and is there to pounce on them, there's really nothing at stake there, right? There's no life and death matter even for the fox. There's just some matters in paper form and no one wants that. So we need to make the substance of what we have to teach meaningful and high stakes all the time. And when we are using stakes in terms of assessment, we have to not make them high all the time because then real learning, real playful engagement doesn't take place. And so we want to challenge ourselves again to be mindful of when the substance needs to be high. Pearson and Post, you know, the outcome of who gets that dirty fox hide really has to matter but the fear students feel about volunteering their reading of what Pufendorf and all those guys had to say, we don't want them afraid of that. So in conclusion, whether you try one or all three of these suggestions, status, and stakes interventions, they are all getting you to the same place. They're getting you to a place where you are being genuinely connected and mindful in the present moment. 
you're listening, you're reading the room, and you are calibrating it as much as you can to really make your students, your scene, partners. Because in some ways, as counterintuitive as it may seem, it's that genuine, present connection that will make the stuff of legend of people and problems that are in the past or far away actually come to life and actually take it to its logical conclusion of becoming the law, right? Capital letters. So thank you.